Hello, everybody. Welcome to Anthropology 101. Welcome to the Asynchronous Lecture. This week, we're talking about anthropology beyond the human and multi-species relationships. This is actually one of the most exciting um, areas of contemporary anthropology in my mind. You know, of course, combined with a lot of the stuff we're doing in terms of like anti-colonialism and anti-racism. Um, yeah. And so we're in this kind of historical moment where anthropologists are increasingly thinking about how do humans and non-humans relate to one another? And how do we think about social relations as actually encompassing beings that are not just human beings, but also non-human beings as well? And so why is this such a big question right now? Well, because our world is on fire. And um, what I'm going to argue in this lecture, right, in part, is that the very kinds of conceptual and cultural frameworks that we use to understand the world and our place in the world as humans have also contributed to these massive um, ecologies of collapse and catastrophe. And so we can also, so we can think about the ways in which um, climate change is really challenging us as a, um, uh, challenging humans to rethink actually I shouldn't say humans, challenging certain groups of humans to really rethink the relationships between human and non-human beings. Um, really challenging a lot of assumptions that had previously just been taken for granted. Now, we can also talk about these kinds of cultural systems. For example, these mass representations of things like starving polar bears and melting ice can't con um, ice melting ice caps. These are, of course, very culturally situated perspectives um, environmental form and forms of environmentalism. A lot of indigenous critics point out that like um, in indigenous conservation circles, you rarely see people talking about abstract animals they've never seen like polar bears. You see them talking more about relationships with animals and plants in the local places where they live and where they grew up and how to maintain good relationships in those places. And so this idea that you would have mass images of starving polar bears with no connection to humans at all, right? There's no humans ever in these pictures. There's no understanding of how do humans relate to polar bears um, in any deep way or particular humans, I should say. That's just a very Eurocentric kind of orientation to climate change. Of course, also California is on fire. A lot of indigenous critics point out that um, Part of the issue here, right, is the um, as a result of genocide and settler colonialism, a lot of indigenous land carrying practices in this area um, and for indigenous forestry practices are just no longer being done. And that has created um, the conditions for these mass fires and catastrophes. Right. So we often think about these spaces, right, the polar bears, the Arctic, the forest as this kind of space of nature that's removed from human society or culture. But the point I'm making here, right, is that um, these are systems that are very much um, created by specific human ways of relating to the world. Um, and that this framework of viewing the natural world, these forestry spaces or polar bears as separate from humans, actually reproduces a lot of colonial violence. And I meant to say, right, part of what we're challenging here with this shift in anthropology is this um, older dynamic that, again, goes back to social evolutionary theory. Um, so many of our cultural assumptions today are based in these evolutionary theories. Um, and one of them is this idea, right, if we talk about societies as on this linear process, this linear evolution from more primitive to more advanced, one of the problems we see in the world today is that these same so-called advanced ways of organizing society are basically, you know, have set the world on fire. Um, and so this is an assumption that in 2020 no longer seems to make sense because the very kinds of cultural values of what is advanced, considered to be advanced or technological or civilized, are the very things that are like threatening our existence um, as a species and leading us into the sixth age of mass extinctions. <laughs>
And another thing that a lot of indigenous critics point out is that apocalypse is not a is not a future event, right? When we talk about climate change in the mainstream, we often think about how do we avoid this catastrophic apocalyptic future? And indigenous critics just say, you know, this is a historical event, not a future one. When we talk about apocalyptic climate change, we're actually talking about the last four centuries. And it's meaningless then to start talking about how do we avoid apocalypse if apocalypse has already been unfolding for 400 years. Now, the big difference between the last 400 years and today is that a lot of people who thought they were secure are finding out that they're also precarious. A lot of settlers are finding out that they are not as secure as they thought they were, but they're also vulnerable to these exact same forms of apocalypse. And there's a philosopher, I love um, Kyle White, um, who has this argument, right, where he basically says, as indigenous peoples, we already live in our ancestors' dystopian futures. Um, the, that dystopian future is our contemporary situation. And one of the ways that a lot of scholars go about making these arguments, right, is they point to um, what's called the Obra Spike, which is this moment in 1610. And if you look at the geological records, you see it's around 1610, this drop, this massive drop in global carbon um, dioxide levels. And so what causes this global drop in carbon dioxide? Well, this is the beginning, right, of, of um, new forms of colonial um, power dynamics and genocide. And what we see is this massive dying of human beings and non-human beings. That, um, and the, breath, the, the absence of all of those people, all of their breaths, um, exhaling carbon dioxide is actually literally marked into the geological record at this point. And so scholars, um, indigenous scholars, look at this and say, if we think about when do we, how do we understand climate change? What are the driving forces? They say we need to start with this Uber spike, right? The ways in which colonialism um, initiated these environmental climate shifts that have been hugely apocalyptic and catastrophic. And then um, moving forward, right, thinking about capitalism, thinking about um, all the different kinds of social relationships that structure um, environmental collapse. And the point here, right, is that climate change is not the fault of humans in a generic sense. It's the fault of a specific way of organizing society. It's the result of specific social systems. And it's not indigenous peoples, overwhelmingly, who are causing climate change. It's capitalism. It's colonialism. And so this is an artist, um, Echo Hawk, who I really love. He does a lot of really cool pop art. And this is a painting called um, The Inheritance. And I love this his work because so much of what he does is he imagines, he's, he's imagining indigenous futures within these apocalyptic wastelands of settler colonialism. How do you care for, how do you care for children in these spaces, spaces of environmental catastrophe? So with that, I'm really setting the stage, right? Why are anthropologists so interested in human, non-human relationships right now? And also thinking about climate change as a social phenomenon, not just a generic human one. Now, I'm gonna, from here, I'm gonna go deeper into the kinds of cultural frameworks that we're talking about, dominant cultural frameworks and alternatives to thinking about the relationships between humans and non-humans. So kind of zooming out a little bit. Now, one of the things we learned from physical anthropology, the subdiscipline of physical anthropology, is that the species, Homo sapiens sapiens, are a species of greater apes, right? Um, we are animals. And yet, on a cultural level, we often distinguish, you know, we talk about humans and animals as if humans were not themselves animals. Or we say humans are just animals as a way to basically legitimize what we would think of as quote unquote baser instincts. You know, um, it's an, you can it's almost like another form of boys will be boys where, oh, well, we're really just animals means like, you know, things like monogamy or patriarchy or competitiveness are just hardwired into our DNA as animals.
But I really want to think about this contradiction. Why do we often distinguish humans from animals? Um, or alternatively, when we say humans are animals, why does that seem to be a matter of justifying hierarchical social systems? If you have time and feel like it, you could, I would recommend this YouTube video called The Gentle Genius of Bonobos. It's Suvin Savage Rumba's TED Talk from 2004. I'm a little skeptical of TED Talks, but it is a kind of fun introduction to physical anthropology um, or an anthropological, uh, physical anthropological issue, which we're not going that deep into the, in this class. But the video is basically about um, a bonobo research society. Bonobos are a species of lesser apes, pretty closely related to humans. Um, it's always fun to see bonobos making fire and um, driving golf carts. Um, I'm skeptical of TED Talks. I think, um, I don't know. And I'm definitely not a physical anthropologist, but, um, it is tradition in intro anthropology courses to show videos of bonobos, but mostly the traditional video is about bonobo sexualities, which I think I'll spare you videos of bonobos fucking each other. And the short version of why that's a thing that people show is basically bonobos are very sexually active creatures. Um, they like having sex with each other a lot. And sex is very deeply integrated into the social structure of most bonobo communities. So that um, there's not the same kind of private public divide like there is in some human societies in which sex is supposed to happen in private settings. Uh, for bonobos, sex is very much an everyday part of social relationships. It's part of how you show a sh affection. It's part of how you apologize for people you've pissed off. It's really a part of most social interactions. So anyway, like I said, I'm sparing you the video, the obligatory video, anth intro to anthropology video of bonobos fucking each other. And instead, you can watch Bonobos driving a golf cart instead. And I will say, you know, I really enjoy thinking about myself as a greater ape because it does challenge the ways I usually move about in the world in a deep way. And I like interacting with my cats because I think a lot about what, like, this weird fucking species of greater ape that, like, locks themselves in these boxes, um, by which I mean houses, um, like these square buildings and um, just has these really deep loving relationships with like cats and other animals. Um, now, my point there again isn't that this is like all humans doing this, but rather thinking about the social systems uh, that we inhabit. But uh, another point worth mentioning here is that, um, well, I forgot it, so I'm just going to keep moving on. So here's a set of some of the questions I'm interested in working through, right? Um, the kind of core questions for today. What do human animal teach? How, what do human animal relationships teach us about human social systems? Um, or I should say more than human social systems, because I just slipped into um, that human first mindset again. I'm also interested in what is the human as a social construct? How is this concept constructed? What's its history? Who's excluded from this category of fully human? How are people animalized or represented as being more animal-like in a way that really is about reproducing um, social inequalities? And from here, we can talk about this concept that some scholars use um, to think through these issues, which is animacy hierarchies. What are the kinds of cultural hierarchies between who's considered more or less alive? Um, in mainstream animacy hierarchies, we tend to talk about humans as being on top, followed by other animals, followed by plants as being less animate than animals, followed by things like minerals, etc., which are considered inanimate. But of course, our real, our actual everyday experience is far more complicated than this. Uh, for example, sometimes I'm really stressed out and I just lie in bed and just being in bed is really comforting for me. And I have this real emotional relationship with my bed in which um, 
even though I would cons- even though it's often considered inanimate, it's something that um, does I don't know that it, sometimes it's a little more than that to me, um, and I think part of our everyday experience just doesn't fit into these hierarchies. Um, or we could talk about the painting I just was mentioning, the Echo Hawk painting. That's a material thing. It's an inanimate object, but it moves me. It animates me. It helps me think about the world and do what I want to do, right? It helps me to have this conversation with you. So there's a way in which I myself am being animated by these objects that we would usually say are inanimate. So again, real life is much more complicated than these conceptual hierarchies that we imagine for ourselves. So when we talk about these dominant ways of thinking about the world and thinking about human non-human um, relationships and hierarchies, can we understand this as a social construction of what it means to be human? And does that social construction have a history? And so one of the examples that I love talking about is this medieval Christian idea of the great chain of being. Basically, this is an animacy hierarchy. You have God at the top. Under that is angelical beings, um, followed by humanity. Then you have the animals. Then you have the plants. And then um, minerals. And of course, Satan's at the bottom. Um, even though Satan, I guess, would be very animate, I think spatially in Christianity, um, Satan is imagined to be below things. But anyway, right, with this idea of the chain of being, you have this understanding of the universe in which everything is connected in this kind of natural hierarchy um, from steps to steps to steps. And this is, of course, as I said, an animacy hierarchy. But then I like to ask my students, OK, so what happens if you flip this anarchy, hier- this um, animacy hierarchy on its head, on its uh, side? What does like does that remind you of anything? This is what the great chain of being looks like on its side. And then I say something like, okay, we can flip this animacy hierarchy, this great chain of being on its side. Um, and then let's take out God and the angels and the devil and see what we're left with. And if this were a Zoom class where we were talking, um, having a back and forth, I'd ask you what that reminds you of, but I can't do that here. But you know where I'm going with this right is, it actually looks a lot like the ways we think about evolution today. Um, you you take this great chain of being, flip it on its side, and cover up God and the devil, and you're left with the model of um, with a diagram that looks very much like the diagram of evolution. So here I am with some examples that look kind of um, to kind of show that comparison. And the point I'm making here, right, is that you have this Christian concept from the medieval ages that actually continues to structure how we think about humans and animals in the natural world in a kind of deep way. On the other hand, you know, history is rarely so simple as a nice progression um, or line. And so, you know, when we think about these kinds of histories, um, it is complicated. Um, So on the one hand, you do have this kind of historical connection between the great chain of being and how we talk about evolution. But on the other hand, evolution also was a major challenge to the received dogma of Christianity at the time. And once people started asking in in Europe and um, the United States, people started saying, oh, humans, the God didn't just create the world the way it is now, but there's this long history of... um, evolution, right, where humans actually evolve out of animals, Um, we are a kind of animal, um, and that there's this really deep history there, um, a time frame that's far longer than what um, Christians had often considered the history of the universe. And as a result, right, you have all of these scholars who start asking these questions like, what does it mean to be human? This totally challenges everything we thought. What does it mean to be human? And when I went to school in university of, at the University of Virginia, the anthropology department actually used to be in a, um, the building used to be the Natural History Museum. And in this Natural History Museum, which was built in the late 1800s, 
you there were these massive um, skeletons of extinct megafauna. There was a mastodon, and there was a giant like beaver that I forget the name of right now. Um, but there were these massive skeletons, right? And the thing is, why do you have this huge interest in um, natural history and extinct megafauna um, in the late 1800s? Well, in the wake of these emerging ideas of evolution, uh, and, he, and scholars asking, what, is, what does it mean to be human? You have basically them asking, like, if we're just animals, where do we fit into the world? And so they study these extinct megafauna, and they come up with these narratives that are basically humans um, hunted megafauna to extinction, which is somewhat true, but not entirely true. That's pretty limited. Um, the history is more complex. But, you know, that's what they thought in the late 1800s. And so the narrative that emerges through these kinds of museums is, where, what, are, what does it mean to be human? What's our place in the world? Well, we're at the top. We're at the top of the natural hierarchy. So on the one hand, this argument I'm making about the great chain of being, it might remind you of the, what we talked about in terms of objectivity, this idea of replacing God with man. But on the other hand, there are also historical conflicts here that have profoundly shaped how we imagine what it means to be human. And what really emerges in this period is this dichotomy, uh, a new way of thinking through these mainstream dominant cultural binaries between the human and the animal and between culture and nature. Right. This is the forest problem I was talking about earlier. Again, we imagine the forest as a space that is a natural environmental system removed from human culture and society. And we imagine these landscapes as being, quote unquote, pristine or untouched by man. But the reality is that these are landscapes that have been systematically cultivated over thousands of years by indigenous peoples. And once you insert these in colonial systems and genocidal systems that radically change these human and relationships with the environment, you create massive destabilization that leads to things like rampant forest fires. And so this very dichotomy of culture versus nature is misleading. Um, parks, of course, natural parks are very much a cultural system. The ideology at the time during the um, presidency of people like Teddy Roosevelt was that it was important for citizens to encounter nature in order to become like real men. Um, citizens, you know, this or like, you know, not just Americans, but also like real rugged men who are in touch with nature and self-reliant. And this was actually the creation of these kinds of spaces um, that we now, these um, national park spaces was very much a nationalist and gendered project. So in anthropology, one of the things we're trying to do is we're trying to break apart these dichotomies between the human and the animal, between nature and culture. And what that means is moving beyond what we can talk about as human exceptionalism. Human exceptionalism is the idea that humans are somehow exceptional um, or somehow fundamentally different from the rest of the world. We're fundamentally different from um, other animals, right? There's something very special about being human that basically makes us non-comparable. And maybe there are special things about being human, I guess. I'm not totally sure. Um, I guess like no other species has like managed to destroy the um, to destroy environments. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that because of course, anyway, that's a conversation for another time. Maybe there are exceptional things about, like there are unique things to the human species, but at the same time, this idea that we are somehow removed from the rest of the world, that's what we're critiquing with this idea of human exceptionalism. And another concept that a lot of scholars are talking about to help us get us beyond these binaries is this idea of becoming. And the idea here is to take this, to take what we would think of as being, or human nature, and turn it into a verb or a process. And the idea is that as people, we're not static. We're constantly in the process of becoming, and we're constantly changing and transforming. And this is a process that always happens in relationship to others. Those others include humans, but they also include non-human beings. You know, my relationships with my cats have a fundamental transformation on who I am as a person. Um, you know, sometimes in subtle ways, sometimes in not so subtle ways. And again, here, I'm trying to move beyond this kind of abstract idea of who I am as a person, as some sort of weird abstract entity that exists in a vacuum, 
and thinking instead about who am I as a person in the context of my material and everyday life. You know, what am I as a, who am I as a person in a concrete sense, in the sense of my relationships to um, other people. And of course, in the U.S., we often talk about being an individual, which is this idea that there's something inherent and um, indivisible about who you are as a person, um, that you are kind of autonomous in a certain way and self-contained. But that's a really limiting cultural framework, I think. And, you know, a lot of indigenous scholars talk about instead this idea of being all my relations. The idea that who you are as a person is the sum of all of your relations with others that is kind of reflected back from your body outward. So we can talk as anthropologists even also um, what are different cultural ways of thinking about what it means to be as a person or a self? What are different ways of relating to human and non-human others? Now I want to talk a little bit about the ways in which these animacy hierarchies intersect with other kinds of hierarchies like racism and colonialism. And I just want to give a trigger warning because I'm going to show some extremely racist images to kind of unpack this. So if you look at the history of racist representations and ideologies and colonial ideologies, one of the moves you see over and over again is to represent colonized peoples or racial others as being more animal-like, as being closer to animals than um, humans, right? Literally dehumanizing them. So this is an image of a um, Jewish person, right? Um, and of course, in Nazi propaganda, you see all kinds of, you know, representations of Jewish people that really emphasize the long nose, making it look hook-like, um, really beak-like, right? Again, to kind of draw this connection between Jews and animals. You see this with anti-immigration policies around the turn of the 1900s or anti-immigration po propaganda in the United States around the turn of the 1900s, as well as this long-standing idea that like, um, and again, trigger warning, because I'm going to use some really fucking violent language here, right? But framing that like these racist ideologies that frame black folk as monkeys or ape-like, right? This is, of course, a racial slur, right? Um, and we see that today again with this image that I, um, from what appears to be a textbook or something demonstrating this process of animalization, the ways in which people like Barack Obama, uh, Barack, Obama um, Barack Obama and his wife are framed as um, are, are, their, their photos are manipulated to make them look like apes. And so there's this very... Um, there's this whole racist logic of animalizing people of color, of animalizing racial others, and in doing so, locating them lower on these animal hierarchies, um, framing them as not necessarily fully human or as, as human. And of course, these kind of of course, these representations are actually super common in um, the history of race in the United States and Europe. And moving from these historical examples to contemporary ones, you know, one thing I think a lot about um, or I think is really interesting is white veganism um, and kinds of black vegan critiques of white veganism. And so one dynamic, right, if you watch a lot of PETA videos or something, you'll see this, um, or other kinds of um, white vegan videos, you'll see this dynamic where the treatment of animals is often compared to being basically like slavery, right? This is like modern day slavery in which um, animals are held captive in these slave systems. And there's even images where they show historical pictures of black people being muzzled with animals being muzzled. And this is, of course, also very dehumanizing because it reproduces these racial dynamics um, of conflating black folk and people of color with animality. And so here's my meme, right, of this person being like, hey, could you stop comparing our experience to uh, um, our experience um, and us to animals? And white vegans say no. Um, there's also a dynamic, right, um, where a lot of uh, in white veganism or mainstream white veganism, right, 
And again, by white veganism, by white veganism, I don't mean just white people who are vegan. I mean the ways in which veganism and mainstream veganism is inflected with these ideologies and social structures of whiteness. And so, like, this other tweet is someone making fun of people who essentially are more concerned about animal rights than human rights. You know, I was vegan for a long time, but I stopped because I realized I was always consuming people's bodies. Um, for example, if you eat only uh, fruits and vegetables, wh who do you think picks those vegetables and what are their working conditions? Is that really just? Um, is that really the radical horizon of our vision of a cruelty-free form of sustaining oneself? Is it really cruelty-free if it's um, produced by, you know, low-paid migrant, low paid migrant labors or slaves? Because, you know, I, I'm actually, I, grew, I spent a lot of time in Florida. I was born there. And slavery absolutely still happens in agricultural fields in Florida. Another kind of current event to tie it to, right, um, is thinking when we think about pandemic, um, the ways in which pandemics are actually structured by specific ways of relating to more than human beings, specific social systems that are encompass um, non-human beings. And so there's been a series of critiques that are really interesting, right? Like um, scientists have spent a lot of time thinking about how um, how did this coronavirus jump from animal species to human species in the last uh, uh, recently. And there was a hypothesis that it was exotic animals, but that seems to be not playing out. And a lot of really interesting critiques are saying, so how does the way in which we relate to the environment, how does the ways we relate to um, non-human beings, especially through the mass slaughter um, meat industry, how does that predispose us to these kinds of pandemic conditions? So I feel like I should rep my um, friend John's article, We Need Eco-Socialism to Stop the Next Pandemic. Um, and of course, there was also an, a Guardian article pointing to specifically factory farms and the ways in which factory farms can structure, structure um, health issues, right, in the ways in which um, diseases um, within animal bodies, animals that are maintained in conditions that are extremely unhealthy and predispose them to disease, and then those disease jump to humans. And then, of course, travel through these complex global networks and systems to become pandemic level. And so thinking about pandemic, right, well, how do we understand the pandemic as a function of specific ways of organizing society, including relationships with the environment, including relationships with non-human others. So coming back around to the readings then, I'm just going to cover a few things to make sure that some of the main points are clear and then let you all discuss. You read Vanessa Watts' article on place thought. She's not an anthropologist, but I, this is one of my favorite articles ever, so I signed it, and I think it is useful for an anthropology class. But her argument, right, is social relations include more than human beings. And she articulates this idea of place thought, which for her is a philosophy rooted in indigenous teachings and traditions and stories. And the idea of place thought is she's breaking apart the dichotomy between mind, body, and land. You know, not only, I've argued in this class, we it's silly to imagine um, humans or a person or an individual or a self as a kind of disembodied mind because we have always have bodies. We always, we can, if you've ever tried to like know the world from a disembodied location, it's very hard to become disembodied. And Vanessa Watts takes this further and says, not only do we always have a body, but we're always in physical place um, and relational place. We're always in relations and we're always in place on land. And so our argument is that place thought is a non-distinctive space where place and thought were never separated because they never could or can be separated. So place and thought for Vanessa Watts are just a false dichotomy that really, um, and this dichotomy, this separation of place and thought enacts a kind of, um, I would say epistemic violence to use a complicated word. What's a better word for a 101 course? It flattens indigenous tradition, philosophical traditions. 
um, in a very Eurocentric way. It interrupts the possibility of indigenous realities. And as Vanessa Watts says, the land is alive and thinking, and humans and non-humans derive agency as extensions of the land's thoughts. Our agency is a function of the thinking land. Our movements are the land thinking in action. So what she's talking right are about indigenous philosophies, indigenous philosophical traditions that are embodied and emplaced. They're not just um, written down in books, although they can be, or they're not just located in disembodied minds, but they're embodied through these elaborate social, moral, and spiritual systems through which humans and non-human beings relate to one another. And her argument is we can draw, um, indigenous peoples can draw on these traditions as resources for imagining and articulating and enacting alternative ways of being, for challenging colonial ways of being and colonial ways of organizing our relationships with the world and with others. And so coming back to the first few slides, right, we can ask how have these colonial ways of being and relating to human others and more than human others, how do these systems generate um, proliferating apocalypses over the last four centuries? Now, Vanessa Watts does use some complicated language, so I want to explain what she's trying to do with that language. Um, my goal here isn't that you need to understand these concepts. Rather, I think my goal is just to give you a working understanding of what they mean in order to better understand Vanessa Watts's argument. But this is not, these concepts are not a requirement for the course. But she talks a lot about epistemology and ontology. These are complicated words that are not necessarily com as complex as when you break them down. And I think it's useful to look at the roots of these words, right? Both of them in an ology, which has to do with the study of or knowledge about. Epistemology is rooted in the word episteme, or episteme, sorry, which ha it means knowledge, it's Greek. Ontology, the root there is onto, or being, that which is. So when she talks about epistemology, she's talking about ways of knowing. She's talking about the theories of knowledge, the ways we understand what it means to know things and how you know things. Ontology then refers to theories of being as opposed to theories of knowing. What are different ways of being in the world? What are different ways of theorizing being? And her argument here, what she's doing is saying that Eurocent what she calls Western thought, but what I would call Eurocentric thought, and I think Eurocentric is far more precise than Western because, first of all, um, Eurocentric points to specific colonial power dynamics, whereas Western kind of points to a kind of monolithic cultural billiard ball that's really misleading. Um, and the other thing is Western is itself an ideological project. You know, countries imagine that they're Western by creating the social construct of like abstract ideas like Europe or civilization, and the idea is Western societies are those that have kind of passed the torch of civilization over this millennia from Egypt to Greece to Rome to um, Western Europe to the United States. And that history is just radically oversimplistic, right? The United States does not really have deep historical roots in Rome or Greece in any kind of tangible way. Um, however, influence that some of the founding fathers were by Roman and Greek philosophy, but rather we can talk about this as an ideological project by which places like the U.S., places like France and England imagined themselves to be part of something called the West by creating this fictitious narrative, this social fiction about um, their relationship to these longer traditions of so-called civilization. Anyway, that's a tangent. The point is, um, Vanessa Watts is saying Eurocentric philosophies tend to separate epistemology from ontology. They seem to, they usually, they tend to separate the work of knowing from being. And place thought is really about thinking about what it means to know and be is inseparable. Um, the way we know the world is always rooted in our, in the places that we inhabit. It's rooted in place thought. It's rooted in the relations, the human and um, non-human relationships that constitute that place. So again, even you could think about her as really taking us deeper even than the English cultural concept of 
the environment, right? Because when we think about, when we use words like the environment, we kind of flatten the world and we imagine the environment as a kind of thing that exists. And Vanessa Watts is saying, no, it's really place. And what is place? Place is the sum total of your relations with others, right? So instead of environment, she's talking about relations. And that's a kind, you know, like if you wanted to go super deep, that's a really interesting move to kind of break apart these monolithic understandings of things like nature and the environment and instead ask, what are our place-based relations with human and non-human beings? And how do those relationships shape how we act in the world, what we do, and how we understand the world? Just a couple pointers that often throw students, um, things I want to emphasize that students often get thrown on. First of all, Vanessa Watts is not articulating an indigenous perspective on land. She is articulating a specifically Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee perspective. And that is not the same as, ind as all indigenous people. In fact, her framework emphasizes the importance of specific nations um, stories as well as the importance of different landscapes and the different relationships that make up different places. So what a theory looks like in um, the context of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee is not necessarily going to be the same thing as what um, the world looks like from the perspective of Creek or Mus uh, Muscogee Creek or Zuni. There are over 500 federally recognized tribes in the United States alone. So it's not a flattened indigenous perspective. It's Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe. Additionally, Vanessa Watts is not articulating a perspective that is more morally pure or closer to nature. These ideas are actually reflections of social evolutionary thought that place indigenous peoples as closer to nature, closer to animals, um, as opposed to political agents within complex global systems. What she is doing is she's drawing on indigenous storytelling traditions and indigenous philosophical traditions in order to articulate a theory that critiques the kinds of colonial, that critiques colonial power, um, and the ways in which colonial power shapes how we conceptualize uh, relations between human and non-human beings. And she's drawing on Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe traditions in order to situate that critique and outline an alternative. But there's nothing more morally pure here. There's, it's not like Vanessa Watts is like putting this indigenous perspective that's morally pure forward. It's that um, Vanessa Watts is a socially conscious critic. She's a social critic, like anyone else we've read this semester. And she's giving us tools for thinking about worlds otherwise. She is doing it from a perspective that is not necessarily a anthropological perspective, from an, but rather an indigenous studies perspective. She's not interested in how indigenous peoples understand the world. She's interested in um, the animate, the, ex, the expressions of the Earth's intentionality. And you read an article by Don Kulik on fat pets. This is just a real fun one, too. Um, and my question for that is, how do fat pets teach us about social relations and power dynamics? Um, how does expanding our scope to thinking about non-human rela human, non -human relations actually deepen our understanding of, of, so of society, of power? And we can raise several questions that I'll let you discuss further if you want in the discussion board. But we can ask, how does the state intervene? How does the state govern human and non-human bodies? How does it, when does it intervene? What are the kinds of social processes through which it intervenes um, and determines what needs to be intervened in and what's fine in order to regulate and discipline human and non-human bodies and relationships? How do these relationships with pets relate to um, broader social and economic histories, like the marketing of pet food? And how do these histories shape um, our contemporary lives with our non-human companions? And of course, how is fatness viewed culturally? 
what does anxieties about fat pets and state interventions having to do with fat pets, what does that tell us about mainstream moral systems? For example, what does a fat pet say about the quote unquote owner? Um, or what is it thought to say about them as a person? How is fatness framed as an individual failure to be under, to be a proper, uh, a failure to be a proper good moral person? Rather than, for example, something that emerges in relation to larger social and political systems. Uh, for example, if you are struggling through poverty, um, high fatty, unhealthy food it tends to be a lot cheaper than fresh food and more easily available and it stores better. So, you know, we can talk about these deeper economic systems. We can talk about health systems and how health systems are shaped by larger social inequalities. But again, right, coming back, to, or we could also ask, like, what are the kinds of cultural constructs of pets or animals, right, where animals are assumed to lack agency. Um, they're assumed to basically be at the, they exist at the whim of humans. So if you have a fat pet, the idea is that says something about the owner. But in some of the cases you were reading about, right, it might be like, you know, this pet has arthritis and can't move around very well, and it's really old. And the one thing it really enjoys in life is eating, which I get. I love eating, too. Um, and so why would you not give this dog this great joy when it can't do things like run around or find joy in other ways that other dogs might, might find joy in? And so essentially, right, circling back around, how, why is it that we have these cultural systems and what does that tell us in which fatness is seen as a moral condition um, that has to do with the individual person? And then how does it speak to these animacy hierarchies in which animals are understood to be lacking in agency as opposed to more complicated emotional relationships between humans and non-human companions? And I just wanted to throw out this website before I close the lecture. Um, for what's called the multi-species salon. This is a kind of hybrid art and anthropology project in which you have these folks who are really imagining, they're trying to reimagine the boundary between human and non-human. And so you can look at all of these um, artistic creations that are really about challenging these dichotomies. And you know, if you wanna spend a moment to kind of explore their website, it's super interesting. And that would be also a great thing to discuss more on the discussion board. As always, here are some discussion questions to guide your conversations if you want some structure, but if you want to go in a different direction, go for it. If you want to talk about the multi-species salon, go for it. If there's something totally different you want to talk about, go for it. That's all great. But in summary, right, we're talking the point, the kinds of point of this class is to think about this emerging field within contemporary anthropology of thinking about society as something that includes non-human others challenging these animacy hierarchies that structure processes like catastrophic climate change, but also thinking about climate change as a system of, as a specific, as reflecting or caused by a specific kind of social system that's really about colonial power and capitalism and capitalist forms of extraction, as opposed to like a generic human nature. And what this means, right, is that as anxious as some of us might be about, about what the future holds for us and thinking in very apocalyptic terms about that future, the fact is we already live in post-apocalyptic landscapes. Um, we've lived in a post-apocalyptic landscape for 400 years. And the real question is why do so many people consider that apocalypse to have happened to someone else um, and as something that's totally separate from their lives? 